So today I'm going to be bringing a message to you out of Psalm chapter 84. And the title of my message is After God's Own Heart. So as we read through the, the scriptures, there's notable figures which stand out of, as examples of imperfect people who came to understand who they were before God. For example, we see King David. And King David was not a perfect man. As a matter of fact, he had a lot of things that he had to work through through his life. But uh, in Acts chapter 13, verses 22 and 23, as recorded by Luke's Gospel, uh, the, uh, uh, the Apostle Paul spoke about David being established as the king of Israel to replace Saul. So Luke writes this. After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him. I, he will do everything I want him to do. From this man's descendants, God has brought Israel, the Savior Jesus, as he has promised. So, Luke brings this recording about David. Being a man after God's own heart. What was David that made him a man after God's own heart? It was certainly not because he was a perfect man. David had character flaws. And we see in the book of Psalms, when you read through the book, David is crying out to God. And someone made the comment this morning that his feelings are written upon the pages of the Psalms. Sometimes he was glad. Sometimes he was in mourning. Sometimes he was distressed because his enemies seemed like they were going to overtake him. But David was kind of a, a snapshot of humanity because in your life and in my life, sometimes we're happy. Sometimes we're sad. Sometimes things go smoothly and sometimes we're in really rough waters. But what made David a cut above others was the fact that the core of his heart was pointed towards God. And King David, he had a, a deep desire to follow God's will and to do everything that God wanted him to do. Today, we're going to look at his psalm in Psalm 84 because it really expresses David's attitude towards the Lord. In verse 1 and 2 of Psalm 84, David writes this. He like, writes, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty! My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of my Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Well, these first two verses, they, they, they resound a lot about what God loved about David. And throughout the ages, many preachers have referred to this psalm as the pearl of, of psalms. And there's just something sweet about it. You see how David clearly understood the majesty of God. Everything within him was attuned to God's presence in the place where God would meet with his people. The tabernacle, the tabernacle properly in the Old Testament is symbolic of God's presence and his meeting place with man. In the days of King David, families would, um, in the surrounding areas, they would, they would go on pilgrimages. They'd make pilgrimages to the tent of meeting, to the tabernacle that had been constructed it started off in the days of Moses before they entered the land of Canaan. The tabernacle was built. It was a tent that was carried. 
And uh, later, when Joshua and the Israelites crossed over the River Jordan and took possession of the land of Canaan, the tent of meeting, the tabernacle was set up in a place called Shiloh, and it was there for 400 years where people would come from all over the place and they would bring their families and they would worship the Lord and they'd offer sacrifices to the Lord at this place until King David, when King David began to rule, he moved the, the Ark of the Covenant to a new tabernacle that he made in Jerusalem into the city of David, which is what is referred to when you look in the Scriptures as Zion. A tabernacle or tent of meeting was a place where Jesus went to meet with God. Or sorry, where people went to meet with God. Sorry, I'm mixing my words up a little this morning. But David understood that God's desire was for his people to draw near him. He desired to reciprocate this relationship and deeply connect with his God. And David physically longed for the experience of God's presence from the very core of his being, with every fabric of who he was. And that's why he was a man after God's own heart. In Psalm verse 1, we see how he introduces this jubilance of coming into God's presence. And in verse 3, he continues here, he says, Even the sparrow has found a home. And to swallow a nest for herself where she may have her young. A place near your altar, Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are forever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. Now, when you read this and the poetic nature of it and, and you, you stop to think about what David is saying here, maybe it's because David spent so many years prior to his life as king as a shepherd under the stars. In the fields surrounding Bethlehem, he watched sheep and I'm sure the grandeur and the majesty of the heavens that were around him would have hit him full force. It's like God, everywhere he looked, was shouting, I am. But more than likely, the beginning of the psalm was referring to the pleasant memories that David has a boy as Jesse and his mom and, and the brothers would all go on pilgrimage and they'd go from Bethlehem and they'd travel to where the tabernacle was in Shiloh. At the same time, you see, multitudes of other people would have been joining them in community. God's always been someone that has wanted to see community amongst his, the believers in him. Sometimes I think we take advantage of community and, and we treat it kind of tritely, but David had some real enthusiasm here about getting together with other people to go to the place where they could meet with God, where they could praise the Lord and connect with each other in this corporate way. In this psalm, David's heart's cry was for closeness with his God. I want to ask, is your heart's cry for closeness with God? The united song of worship that the saints are created for is found in community with like-minded people. People like you who are here this morning to worship the Lord. And I am always glad when we come to these public meetings of worship on Sunday morning. I, there, there's just something sweet about it. And, you know, sometimes in this world we can get distracted by many other things. Sometimes in the world that we live in, in the culture that we live in, we, we have entertainment things. Sometimes we got work interests. Sometimes we have uh, family interests. And 
those kind of interests can capitalize our lives to the point where we squeeze out regular corporate gathering together to worship the Lord our God, our maker. But David, you see, he recognized something. And I, it's good for us to recognize this as well, that being in the presence of the King of Kings together at a certain place with other believers is, is an awesome place to be rooted. It's a place of great value that, that is to be treasured. Almost more than anything else, to be in a place where we're worshiping the Lord, that's the best place on earth. I don't know if you've experienced this, but if you haven't, maybe you need to let go a little bit. When you come into corporate worship and we begin to sing songs, we're not singing to the other people around us. We're singing to the Lord, our God, our Creator. We're singing to Jesus. And if you just shut everything else out around you and you focus on the Lord and you adore Him and you praise Him and you worship Him, and you do that with all your heart, not worrying about anyone else around you or whether you sing like a canary or you sing like a crow. <laughs> because it doesn't matter. God's, God has created us all differently, but together He's created us to be corporately worshiping Him. And when we're corporately worshiping Him, we're in the best place. In another psalm, in Psalm 511, the second half of it, David said, let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them sing ever, ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them that those who love your name may rejoice in you. you don't you hear the, the, the cry for intimacy with God from David? He wanted to be close to the place where God meets his people. He couldn't wait to get to that place. And in his day, that was the tabernacle, the, the, play, the tent of meeting. That was the place where they gathered. This is the beauty of being in faith community. He understood that this uh, place um, had come, it was a place where, where, uh, where all God's people could gather and give praise to the one who made life possible. And there's something about that. Now, when I was in Israel, it says in verse 3, even the sparrow found a home and the swallow a nest for herself. I was in Israel. I had this great, tremendous opportunity to go there back in 2019. And in the course of being there, um, there was a place overlooking the Kidron Valley under the streets of, of the old city of David, up above there is excavation under the streets down to the cobblestone of the original structure that was under there. And they told us, our tour guide told us, this is very likely what we believe to be the palace of King David. And the reason they said that is because of the capitals. And I've shared this before, but I wanted to share it again. This is actually a picture. I took a couple pictures of it. Okay, that's the cobblestone inside that they dug down under the street, way down to the bottom. And they said this was part of the Palace of David. Could I see the next photo? Yeah. And this is where I happened to be standing when I was there. And out the front, you see the Kidron Valley out front. And the excavation had come way back into the, into the hill. And so I was standing just over 100 feet in the mouth of this cave of excavation. And I... Okay, who here feels really small? Like small in life, right? Most of us do. We're just little specks, just tiny little things. You know, when you consider the vastness of the universe, when you look up, when I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and, David said this, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that, are, that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you would visit him. God is vast and he's more powerful than any word can express. And we're so tiny. I was feeling really small because there's all these pilgrims, all these people that are going through this place. And I'm in this group of people. They, they're from a different church and stuff. And so I was by myself. And I felt like a little speck of dust. I felt like a little tiny 
guy. I'm like, God, I love you, but what can I give? What can I bring to the King of Kings? Here I am. And it was, it hit me like a two ton truck. I'm here in the palace of David. He could very well have been writing the Psalms right here. And I just felt like here I've been, I felt so grateful, but so small. And like, what, what can I offer you, Lord, in service to you? And then I open my eyes after praying, and I'm standing on the catwalk right where this picture is taken here. And then I look in front of me, and I see this on the rocks below where I am, inside this cave, way back in the cave. These two sparrows landed right in front of me, and I'm looking. And this sparrow right here was hopping around on all these cobblestones on the palace floor. And this little guy here was hopping around behind. And at the time, I didn't really, they looked almost the same size. I thought, well, well there's just two sparrows. Like, the one in the front was picking away, pick, 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 in between the cobblestones. And the other one was following around and behind it. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, the little one all of a sudden goes up to the, the bigger one and opens its mouth and goes, ah! And the big one begins to feed the little one. But they're just two little sparrows. They didn't even look. You could hardly distinguish them. They both flew. They're, this one's almost grown up. But, and all of a sudden, the, the Lord's word in my spirit came to me. You know, you're all very small. And you don't have much to offer, but I, that's not what I'm after. I want your heart. I want your heart. Feed from my word. Glean from the table of David. Maybe the tabernacle that he set the Ark of the Covenant in from Shiloh was set right here. Maybe these birds were picking away at ancient grain that had fallen into the cracks between the cobblestones and been buried by, by dust. Because they're picking at seeds of some kind and there's nothing growing way back in there. So where did it come from? Why are they doing this? Because they're gleaning from the floor something. I don't know. But in inwardly it was like, God, I'm a little sparrow. Just like you are. You're just a little sparrow. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love you though and he cares for you. And he wants you to glean from the floor of, of the great men and women of God that came before us and wrote their stories are written in the Word. The food from the spiritual food of the Word of God, we feed on that. And then God puts little sparrows in our track just because He loves us and He loves others. So He gives us the opportunity to take what we've found and to feed it to other little sparrows. I don't know, but this floored me. I had to share this again because I, I know I shared it once before. But it's such, it was the most powerful thing. It was just like, God, thank you. You are great. I'm small, but you have a purpose for us small people to do your work and to pass on what you feed us and feed others with that. Amen. You see, David said this, or this was said of him in uh, 1 Chronicles 16, 1-7. See, they brought the ark of God and set it inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And then they presented burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before God. After David had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. Then he gave a loaf of bread and a cake of dates and a cake of raisins to each Israelite man and woman. And he appointed some of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord to extol, to thank, to praise the Lord, the God of Israel. Asaph was the chief. The next to him in rank were Zechariah, then Jaziel, Shimeoth, Jehiel, Mathiah, Eliab, Beniah, Obed-Edom, and Jeel. They were to play the lyres and harps. Asaph was to sound the cymbals. And Benaiah and Jeziel, the priests, were to blow the trumpets regularly before the Ark of the Covenant of God. That day, David first appointed Asaph and his, associ and his associates to give praise to the Lord God in this manner. 
praise the Lord. See, David was, his heart was after God. He didn't care what anyone thought. He just wanted to praise God because God is worthy. Folks, when we come to praise God, some people come praise God for something to get out of it for themselves. But David didn't do that. He came to praise God because God's worthy of praise. Not because he's going to get something out of it, but guess what? In the midst of praising the Lord and giving honor and praise to the, the, the Lord of heaven, our hearts are filled with joy because God smiles. And, and when we praise the Lord, folks, there is an intimacy that comes spiritually when we let go. When we don't care about anyone else around us, where we just focus in on Jesus, we worship him, there is something special that happens. See, every Sunday that we come together is a beautiful event. If only those living on the peripheral, on the outside of the church, could see God's people. How we were meant to be together. Yesterday we had this breakfast. <laughs> One of our brothers Henry here gave his testimony and you know God does unique things with people and brings people from different places and he brought us all together. I'm looking at that I'm going there's a real fellowship of brothers here. It's so good. Today when we look out all around you just look around you. These people have been put on the path with you. Why? Because he knows that God knows that you need each other to encourage one another, to, to pass on the little seeds maybe that fall in the cracks between the cobblestones from when you're reading the Word of God. You can encourage people next to you and they can encourage you. But we come to praise the Lord and we come to worship the Lord. We come to extol His name. And when we do, God is well pleased and there is intimacy in our walk with Him. David says that even swallows build their nest close to the altar and tabernacle. Blessed are those whose strength is in the Lord, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. And he continues saying in his psalm in verses 6 and 7, as they pass through the valley of Baca, and they make it a place... They make it a place of springs. The autumn rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. So you can just picture David as he's thinking about his family's trek to go worship the Lord. And then as he's king, how all the people would come to the tabernacle of the Lord. And the area where they lived was, was dry and uh, and destitute. The area surrounding Jer Jerusalem is a dry desert. But those who are on pilgrimage to worship the Lord turn a dry place into a place where there are springs and pools of refreshing water to quench the thirsty soul. For God is with them even in the parched valley. The picture here is that believers collectively being together bring refreshment to each other. They bring refreshment because God brings the rains, that, the autumn rains that fill the pools. And it's like this, when we come together, the desert that's all around us is so dry and thirsty. This place that we gather together can become a place of refreshing place of pools and springs in the middle of a desert. Sometimes we think that to escape life's deserts, we need to get away from it all. Maybe we need to pursue a holiday or an amusement park or an exotic location, and that's what we need. And it's nice to get away. I'm not saying it's not nice to get away. It's good. But that's not going to ultimately satisfy the thirst in our souls for being refreshed. Refreshment occurs in the Spirit when we come to trust in God, when we come to look to God for our sustenance, 
that even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we fear no evil for He is with us. His rod and His staff, they comfort us. It doesn't matter whether we're in a green pasture and we're feeding on the greatest, greenest grass as the sheep of the Lord. Or whether we be we're led beside still waters and we're drinking from the refreshing springs of waters. Or even when we're walking through the dark, deep valley of the shadow of death, we need not fear evil because the good shepherd, he is with us and he leads us into righteousness for his name's sake. God wants to lead us to that place where we let, we let go. And even in the difficult times, we find refreshing pools, springs of living water, See, David echoed this. See, in Psalm 42, 1 to 5, he echoes this. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all that day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the Mighty One with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you so downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for yet I will praise Him, my Savior and my God. Do you hear David's heart? doesn't matter the circumstances, whether you're in this throng, in this happy place where everyone's praising Him, or whether you're in a place where, where things are tough. This is why David this is why David was considered a man after God's own heart and why God encourages us to have that heart like David to humble ourselves before him and to and to seek him and to give up our ideas of of how to do things on our own strength and to let him be our guide and to not be discouraged when things are tough and to rejoice when things are going well. Just listen to what he cries out. David cries out in the next verses of our text saying in verse 8, Hear my prayer, Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, God of Jacob. Look on our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. What a wonderful truth revealed here. Now, many scholars consider this passage here that I just read, it, it, the heart cry of David, to be speaking prophetically about the coming Messiah, and I believe that to be true. David had been told that there would be coming in the future as his son out of his house and lineage, one who would be Emmanuel, God with us, Lord and Savior. And he writes of his future Messiah to come where he says, the Lord says to my Lord in Psalm 1101, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. As David and the singers in the court of the temple, of the tabernacle, as they cry out, hear my prayer, Lord Almighty. Listen to me, God of Jacob. Look on our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. In this verse, we have the nation's prayer for David and the believers. Let the Father, God, look upon the Lord God, the Son, Jesus Christ, our shield, our protector. Look upon him, the anointed one, and we shall be shielded from all harm the Father look upon the Son and behold the face of His anointed. And may we be able to behold the countenance of the Lord with joy. And we desire that He will look at us through the love in His Son and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. David understood the truth. He, can, he, he came to understand the secret. The secret that all of us can come to discover that the best days of our life are spent in the presence of God. And that's not only true corporately, 
but in personal places as well where we quietly come before God and we bow the knee of our heart to him and we worship deeply and we say, God, you are faithful. Thank you, God, my Savior, for all that you are, for all that you have done. Would you take my life as an offering to you, Lord, and take it in any direction you want it to go. I don't want to hold anything back from you, Lord. I just want what you want. I want to go where you want me to go. Praise you, O Lord, for you are faithful. You've been faithful in the past and you'll continue to be faithful in the future, O God. See, King David and his family had a place where they would go to meet with the Lord. It was a tabernacle. And they would meet with other people. And this was a lovely place to be, but as the believers in the Lord Jesus Christ today under the new covenant we've been given in this new covenant through the sacrificial work of the Lord Jesus and when we are in a dry and thirsty land we do not have to go to the tabernacle or the tent of meeting in a physical place over in Jerusalem we don't have to take pilgrimage to go there the pilgrimage is right here and right now do you not know that when you come to know the Lord Jesus as your Savior you are the temple of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit lives inside of you and this is why Jesus said to the woman at the well the woman who he told everything about she was married many times and the man she was living with at the present time was not her husband and he knew exactly where she was and when this Samaritan woman came in John 4, 7 to 14, Jesus explained this. When the Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy some food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would not you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman says, you have nothing to draw water with, draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself as did his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water that I give will never thirst Indeed, the water that I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. This is the water that Jesus has, has, has given to us. These are the pools of water in the desert that God has brought. You don't have to go somewhere to, to meet with God. You can meet with God right where you are. But together, as a corporate body of believers, when we come together, where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of, of you. And don't, don't be deceived. It's not the same when you're out there by yourself. There's something special about collectively coming to worship the Lord. There's something special about it. There's a collective anointing, you might say. When we mention the word anointing, some people go, what is that? Well, anointing represents the Holy Spirit being, being over, filling, and covering everything. When an oil, when, when, you, when, you, when you're sick and you want prayer to be, to be healed physically, the Bible says that the the elder should gather and pray for you and anoint you with oil. That represents that anointing represents the, the presence of, and of the Holy Spirit amongst you. And if God is living in each one of us individually, he's also living in each one of us corporately. Oh, it's beautiful. And there's pictures of this in the Word of God that were living stones rising up, stacked upon each other upon the foundation of Christ as the cornerstone and the apostles of the foundation, rising up to become a place where God dwells. Living stones filled with the Spirit, but filled with the Spirit collectively as well. This is what God desires. Oh, when we're going, when, we're, when those who are on pilgrimage are going through the dry and weary lands of this world come to the water come to the water at home 
Come to the water when you're at work. Come to the water collectively together when you have the opportunity to encourage and lift one another up and build one another up and worship the Lord together. This is why God desires that we pray without ceasing. It's not like we're closing our eyes and we're not concentrating on our tasks, but in that attitude of, of submission to God, no matter where we go, whether at work, whether we're at play, some of the best times I've had have been alone when I'm looking out over a mountain scene in a valley filled with greenery. That can be a great place too. It, it's everywhere we go, but collectively we are... There's something special here. And that's why David was excited about going to the tabernacle. Because that's where God chose to meet with them. Now God chooses to meet with you here. The psalmist continues in verse 11, For the Lord our God, for the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Blessed is the one. No, you can't come to God's presence on your own. It's only when you submit your spirit under the lordship of Jesus Christ that you can come into his presence. You can't be religious enough to gain favor with God. You're not good enough. You can't be good enough. It is only a work of grace through faith that you can be saved. There's many people who try all their lives to be good Christians by trying on their own strength to find pools of water. But it's all self-driven. And you're not going to find it there. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. That's the heart's cry of David. How lovely is that place? You know how lovely that place is? That place of closeness with God inside your spirit when you've repented of your sin? Where God calls you to turn your back on the ways that you used to live when you're part, when you when you followed the the powers of darkness and the prince of this world, you turn your back on that and you follow him. You say, Lord Jesus, have mercy upon me and the sacrifice of the blood of Christ, the Passover lamb, takes away your sin and removes it from your spirit and casts it as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered again. And then you become a place that is clean, God can't dwell in a place that is not submitted to Him. You must submit your life to the Lord. You must turn your back on the ways of the things that you used to do in the world before you will experience this filling of living water. Because it is not by your effort that you're going to be saved. You might as well stop trying because you can't do it. We're all too sinful but by grace. When we call out on the name of the Lord and we turn our back and we say, Lord, I don't care what it takes. I'm going to follow You. I'm going to live for You. I'm not going to do the things that I used to do. I'm surrendering that to You. You do that in sincerity. And the Lord comes and He cleans you out, makes you clean as freshly fallen snow, clean and pure, not because of yourself, but because of the sacrifice of Christ. And then the Spirit comes in and makes his home inside of you. You are cleaned not to be empty and to be cleaned over and over again. That's not how it goes. You're cleaned so that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God, can come in and take residence in you and live in you. How lovely is your dwelling place. Oh, Lord Almighty, this week I've been so grateful, grateful, to be saved, to know the Lord, to be able to pray to Him and to feel that closeness with the Lord. Oh, and He walks with me and He talks with me and He tells me I am His own. Remember that old hymn? And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other can ever know. It's a garden. It's a garden of God inside. 
a place of living water where the soul is satisfied. This is what God wants us to live in abundance with. He wants us to live in that place. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. This is the heart cry of David, what he wanted. This is what he wanted. And this is what God has offered now through the new covenant in his blood to every person. We don't have to go on pilgrimage far away. I don't have to go. It's nice to go, to go see Israel. I don't have to. Pilgrimage can be a place where I come regularly. And that's what's beautiful about this place. Amen. The Apostle Peter says in Acts 4 to 12, Luke writes it, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Jesus Christ is Lord and the mediator between sinful man and a holy God. Amen. Better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. Do you understand? We can celebrate. We can be filled with joy. We can come to the Lord every day and say, praise you, Lord, for you are good. Thank you, Jesus, for being who you are. This is the message of the psalm in 80, Psalm 84. And folks, you can have the heart of David, a heart after God's own heart. Humble yourself before the living God. Humble yourself. Cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Amen. Let us pray. Jonathan, would you come? Lord, we thank you for new life. We thank you for springs of living water in the desert. We thank you for the food that comes from your table that sustains us. We thank you for the fellowship of believers in you, the corporate structure that there is in the church, but also the individual power that there is in being a place where you dwell. God, we worship you this morning. We give you praise. We give you honor. We thank you for those that have taken the step this, this morning of obedience and the waters of baptism. And for those of us who have been there, Lord, we're so thankful for, for our brothers and sisters here today. We're thankful for those that have, have, have publicly expressed a, a, a desire to follow and to serve you and be accountable to to others around them. And, and Father, we just pray that as we go forward, that, Father, we would recognize the, the great privilege that we have under the new covenant to be in your dwelling place and to give praise and worship to you everywhere we go. God, may your grace and peace rest on people and help them to have a great day. Thank you, God, for this time of celebration. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.